So it just takes a few extra key clicks, but please do that. So, all right, and John will talk about antenna basics, and you've got a bit of extra time. Thank you very much. I've got a 10-page uh, paper here with a lot of references. If you like a copy of the paper, which has got superb colour pictures of the insides <laughs> of all of these, <laughs> please get the <laughs> one-page flyer up the back and the email address is there. There's no cost for it. No cost. All free. Go for it. <laughs> now, where's my picture? I've got... Uh, Yes, yeah, I'll put it there. So it should be there. That's the one. Thank you. Now, this the now I've lost them. Oh, no. Yep, that's it. Okay, so we're going to talk about simple and effective antennas for amateur radio operators. If the slide number two comes up. That's it? Thanks. There's no way I can cover all of those topics in 20 minutes, so I don't intend to, but what I will do is define for you an antenna as a starting point. Antennas are radiators. Good ones radiate electromagnetic energy, enabling communications over varying distances. So that's just a view from me. But here's a definition from the ARRL. Antennas belong to a class of devices called transducers. The term is derived, derived from two Latin words, meaning lead across or to transfer. Thus, a transducer is a device that transfers or converts energy from one form to another. In our case, radio frequency to electromagnetic radiation. So, the next point is resonant antennas. Now, I haven't got time to deal with this in detail, but a resonant antenna is only resonant at one point in the band for which you construct it. If you make an antenna for 40 metres, you pick the point at where it's going to be resonant. If you make a dipole, it'll only be resonant at one point. And if you plot the VSWR, it'll start up high at the bottom end of the band. It'll go like that. It'll be a U-shaped curve. In the dead centre of the U, you might be lucky to get a 1.1 VSWR, all other things being equal. But for amateurs, particularly those beginning out or those who want to operate in the field, portable operation, there's no better choice than a resonant antenna, in particular a dipole. But there's another antenna that also works quite well and is easy to make, and that's an N-fed half wave. Now, I use an N-fed half wave. And there's a antenna coupler I made. No, I don't take this up on the top of mountains. It's heavy. You can't commercially, or you can't obtain commercially, an N-fed antenna tuner. Now, let me correct that. You couldn't until very recently. Now, I know people use auto tuners and feed half-wave antennas. And in my paper, you'll find a calculator which will give you an idea of the best length of a wire antenna for a auto wire tuner without imposing enormous loads uh, to be converted in impedance by that machine so it gets hot. Now I made this one from a circuit in the ARRL. There is now a little baby N-fed antenna tuner on the market, coupler, and that's made by Soda Beams. It's great, but it'll only handle six watts. Mine will handle 400. <laughs> and uh, the circuit and pictures are in the paper. Non-resonant antennas. I've got some details of a number of them there. That's too loud when I get close, isn't it? The favourite is a universal antenna so described in the AWR antenna book for many, many years. It is not a G5RV. A universal antenna is a great one if you've only got room for a single wire antenna cut for, say, 80 metres, and you feed it with open wire feeder, say 450 ohms or 600 ohms if you make it yourself, and the way to feed that antenna is a homemade, uh, courtesy of Rob Gurr, sewer pipe ballon. <laughs> Rob put me onto the articles for this. This is a marvellous ballon. 
because what this enables you to do is to feed your antenna via coax from the, shop, from the shack and you place this up under the eaves where it stays dry and you take your twin lead, your open wire feeder from the two points there. This, is a, this works really well and if anyone's interested in the article, I've probably uh, still got them somewhere tucked away in my archives. <laughs> So a universal antenna system is the only non-resident antenna that I would recommend for beginning amateurs. Now, there's one bloke here this morning, I'm looking at him now, kept saying how good the G5RV is. But how many people in this room can describe how it works band by band? I'd be surprised if there were very many. Lewis Varney. G5RV died on June 28, 2000. He was 89. He had visited Adelaide, as was pointed out. He developed the popular non-resonant multiband antenna now known by his call sign, G5RV. He described the dipole cut for 102 feet, imperial measure, with a transformer 29 feet 6 inches in length of 300 ohm ribbon, or 34 feet of open wire feeder, coupled to the centre and then at the other end of it fed into 50 ohm coax. It is a complex antenna. Some people can get them to work reasonably well. I don't recommend them, but if you're interested in how they work, uh, Moxon, in his uh, popular book, has a detailed explanation on page 185 FF and you can get the reference from my paper free of charge. <laughs> Random wires. Random wires are very popular. Don't recommend them for field antennas. They won't work if you're on top of rock. What's that? No earth. No, no, no decent return. You might get away with a counterpoise or two or three, but um, not recommended. But they work okay at home. The foundation handbook published by the WIA describes an antenna they call uh, an up and out. Uh, 30 feet, 33 feet out and 33 feet up. And uh, that's what they call it. But I found in another book the same antenna described as a vertical tipped on its side. And that's equally as accurate. You, can you work that one out? The counterpoise pretends it's an earth as far as the transceiver is concerned. One band, it's looking at a 50 ohm impedance. Quite good, works well with a tuner. If coupler I should say if you have a really effective grounding. I've used one in the past, had a lot of fun with it, but I certainly wouldn't use one in the field. Uh, balanced versus unbalanced antennas. I would never use at home an unbalanced antenna. Uh, I've played around with balance and this is a this one will handle terrible amount of power because it's dual cord. <laughs> it's a four to one. So it does exactly the same electrically as that one does, but it's in a lot smaller box. I've never used that one as a permanent installation, but what I did do with it was spend hours and hours and hours trying to get the blessed thing flat from 80 through to, to uh, 10 metres. I could get it flat on 80, 40, 20, and then I found that the capacity of the thing to match, match impedances uh, declined the further up the frequency spectrum you went. So, but it, it was a great learning experience for me. If I'm in the field and I'm running, most of the time I run 5 watts, occasionally I might run 10, 15. I have been known to wind up an 8, 9, 7 to 40 watts, highest I've ever been in the field. Uh, I don't worry about a balanced antenna. Um, sure, you might get an unbalanced pattern if you're properly set up. I've never ever experienced any RF current on the coax but I know some people have. But if you're worried about that, simply put some beads at the top of your feed line. If you want to put a ballon in, it weighs. And if you've got an antenna slung between uh, two trees and a script pole in the center and you whack a ballon up there, the thing will blow around. It's just not necessary for a QRP station. Polarization, not really an issue for us today talking about HF. Uh, antenna couplers. Uh, I've got a lot to say about these things. In the wrong hands, they're an absolute menace. 
have a listen at the ba at the weekend on the bands, 40 metre band, you'll hear people <laughs> churning up and taking what seems, well, close to a minute sometimes. And you can see them trying to squeeze that last little bit of power out of a valve rig, valve finals, and they're just causing havoc. If you want to play with non-resonant antennas or in-fed, if you're going to use one, I used to use this a lot on 160 metres AM with a homebrew uh, transmitter, receiver combination. Uh, you can always find a spot where there's no one else working. Tune up on low power, makes, it's not that critical. Have a little VSWR bridge in circuit, tune up and then you're right. And you can move up and down a few kilohertz, even on 160 without having to retune. So you've done the job once and for all. You will need something with an end fed half wave. And uh, this does the job really well, but it's only suitable for a home station. This one is built too for considerable RF. I loaded up a quarter wavelength long wire antenna for 160 on 80 and 40 and 20 with this thing and it worked really, really well. So, antenna couplers, <coughs> um, great gadgets and if you get the paper you'll get the circuits, you'll get the references for the circuits and um, with this one, this came from a very old book by um, Orr and Cowan, Bill Orr and Stuart Cowan uh, and uh, back in the 70s and you'll see the way they, they built theirs on a breadboard, I would never build a coupler on a breadboard, it's sealed for RF and my approach is entirely different. You'll see their picture compared with how I approached it. Um, there's a picture in there which you can get and it shows the capacitor uh, sitting above ground. I mounted the capacitor on a piece of, piece of uh, Lexan and then that in turn sits up about a centimetre off the bottom of the case. And uh, that's an absolute requirement with a parallel tuned circuit for an end fed antenna. Absolute requirement. So a little bit of messing around there. Constructional techniques. I see MFJ sell a G5RV and resonant dipoles in Australia through Ross, and they're made out of blessed un, uh, uncovered earth wire, multi strand copper wire. Don't buy one. If you live near the sea, it'll be gone in no time. Don't buy it. I would never, ever make an antenna without some plastic covering on it, if you want it to last. And uh, the other, I've got a few notes here on basic constructional techniques. Um, for field antennas, the way I couple the various sections together is use Anderson power poles, the uh, 30 amp ones, the little red and black ones you can buy at JCAR expensively and get from overseas a bit less expensively unless you pay US postage. And uh, uh, they make excellent ways of coupling uh, link dipoles together so you can quickly drop the antenna down, pull the sections apart and finish up on 20 metres or the band of your choice. Please explain link dipoles. To the it's, if you look at Stuart and uh, Orr and Cowan's book, they'll call it an outrigger. So if you're familiar with, a lot of people make an 80 metre DXs on 80 metres, will have an 80 metre antenna cut, say, for 3.6. If they go up into the DX window, what happens to the reflected power? That's right. So what you do is you make your antenna for 80 metres and pick your 3.6 as the centre point, and then you make a link about, I've just forgotten the distance, it's about in, in feet, imperial, about two feet, three inches, up one leg and put in an alligator clip or something more waterproof than that. So when you want to whiz up to the DX window and work DX, you just shorten the antenna. That's what an outrigger is. Today's term, link. So it's a way of turning an antenna cut for one band into an antenna of a higher band simply by breaking the antenna at a convenient point. Some people use switches, some use bullet connectors, Others use alligator clips. The commercial one comes with alligator clips from the UK. Tiny little ones. Uh, you should say crocodile clips because I've got a point on them. And, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, they're still awake after lunch. And, uh, but power poles work really well if you know how to work a power pole. You don't want a power pole that pulls apart. 
when I first started, I've been using power poles, I suppose, for over a decade. When I first started to put them together, I would trim the wire, whatever the thickness, uh, say uh, 12 gauge, 10 gauge wire, trim a bit of the plastic covering off, the length of the insert in the little paddle that goes inside or splayed, and then uh, solder it at the point it comes out, and then run a hot iron down the split in the circular part where the wire goes in, if you can follow that. It works, but a far better way of using power poles is to crimp them. And you can use any, well there's a lot of scientific evidence now to show which is emerging. It took a long time to convince me, but the evidence is emerging that these uh, joins work better and are less subject to stress. There's an enormous amount of stress on a connector which is soldered and flapping around in the wind. Yeah, we have the oxidons. Sorry? The, the, the copper and the, the um, plated uh, fittings will oxidise after time. And you, it doesn't run. The chemicals must run. Well, if you buy good quality Anderson power poles, they won't oxidise. Never had them, never had that problem. And I've never had a breakage since I've been uh, crimping them. Now I used a little homemade, not homemade, cheap El Crimpo which I bought at JCAR, but now I have the proper power pole crimper from the US that does a splendid job. Larry. John, I agree totally with crimping is better. What we do, we do it commercially, is we use Almanox. We put, just dip it in Almanox, then crimp it. Almanox, as people aren't aware, is a, uh, is a lubricant and it, it has aluminium pieces in it, so that it works by compression. Yep. If, you, if you put it on, you will never ever have a problem. We use it on that. And where do you get Almanox? Brilliant stuff. Uh, well, I know where I get mine, John. Yeah, I know, but where does he get it? <laughs> <laughs> Might be worth finding out. Just, just do a Google on Almanox. Almanox. Great stuff. Great job. Uh, so, uh, other constructional techniques uh, for centres of dipoles, particularly uh, out in the field, you can make your own centre point out of a bit of uh, Perspex, uh, Lexan, polycarbonate of any sort, works well and uh, you can have a little loop made out of uh, fine strong cord like Venetian cord which just slips over the top of the squid pole and holds the thing vertically. What There is a commercial ballon uh, and I have one of these for um, uh, a link dipole antenna. I haven't used it yet. My concern about the ballon is a design fault, as far as I'm concerned. The uh, RF connector is a BNC, but instead of being at the bottom and facing directly down, it sticks out the side. So you connect the thing, then you've got to take the stress off the joint, which means you've got to double it back up to the top of the perspex. That means it's permanently fixed, or if you want to take it off, you've got to cut the cable tie a nuisance when you're on top of some peak, you've spent an hour and a half, two hours slavishly lugging all this gear up to the top. Uh, it would be better if the ballon was designed with the uh, connector at the bottom, and I can't for the life of me work out why I didn't do it, and then you could just loop it back towards the top with a much more generous loop, so there's less strain on the BNC, and then take it away to your radio. So there are lots of little uh, techniques like that that are worth uh, uh, having a look at. And... Uh, Outlock is available at Blackwoods. Uh, Blackwoods? Ah, Blackwoods. Very good. Uh, so what's happened now? There's nothing on the screen. Needs to be up. So that one there, I've said that. Yeah. Um, there are a whole lot of pictures in here and references. The, the final few comments I'd make, so Paul gets another couple of minutes up his sleeve, is that first, antennas and impedance matching devices, to give them a proper term, are great ways for the beginning amateur to get into doing some home brewing. These are all very simple. I might, I, I don't have a fancy workshop. All of this was chassis bashing on the table out in the backyard. <laughs> this one made with a hand drill so, and nibbler. So tough going. 
And uh, I, in the last few years, I've got myself a drill press, which makes it a lot easier. Antennas, great way to get into home brewing. Manual tuners, couplers, impedance matching devices. Uh, great fun and much better and easier to use than auto tuners. Have a listen to the noise generated by auto tuners on the air. Now, I, I do have a couple, but I hardly ever use them anymore. Um, really, a waste of money as far as I'm concerned. Any questions before I do my next little job? Now, I was offered a pay increase today for doing this, but I declined, you'll be glad to know. That's why the fees were kept at $5. <laughs> what can I say about the next speaker? Oh, sorry. Just to back up your solder joint as opposed to unsolder joint. Good on you. My alligator clip broke because I soldered it for a while. Yeah. 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 Crapping. It, it took, I took a long time to be convinced. I did a lot of reading on it. There's a fair bit of evidence uh, around metal fracturing and so on which suggests it's the way to go for antennas. So, an almanox, I remember that. Now, 